Our first speaker, I will be honest with you, my, our first speaker is on a, on a clipboard that I thought was right here, but it's not here. So rather than introduce the first speaker myself, I, I will introduce the first speaker myself. I changed my mind. Thank you so much. Please, come, come. How are you? Are you the first speaker? No. No. Well, introduce yourself. What's your name? I am the first speaker. Oh, and you are the... <laughs> Who planned this? You guys have to keep me informed. I'm the MC, okay? Well, come here. I want to... Let's do something. Dr. Atal, hold my hand. Now, this... Don't you guys grow up? We're just holding hands. In East Africa, I've spent a lot of time in Tanzania, and, and good friends hold hands when they walk down the street. I don't know if anyone's been there, but we're going to assume that we're friends, so we're going to hold hands for this intro. I'm trying something new here. <laughs> Dr. Anthony Atala is the director of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative... Okay, that's, we can do it like that. Is, is, the, is the director of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine and the W.H. Boyce Professor and Chair of the Department of Urology at Wake Forest University. Dr. Atala is a practicing surgeon and a researcher in the area of regenerative medicine. His current work focuses on growing new human cells, tissues, and organs. Thank you very much and give it up. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I must say that was the most uh, unusual introduction that I've ever had, but it's great to be here, it's great to see you, it's great to be at TEDx Wake Forest, and especially the fact that this is actually my home, so it's great to be here at Wake Forest and in Winston-Salem. What I thought I would do for you today is actually give you an overview of what we do in what we now call the field of regenerative medicine. This is actually a painting that hangs at the Count Waite Library at Harvard Medical School, and it shows the very first time that an organ was ever transplanted. In the back room, you see Harwell Harrison, the surgeon, uh, urologist, actually retrieving the organ, which happened to be a kidney. In the front room, you see Joe Mary actually getting the patient ready to receive it. This happened back in 1954. So many advances, so many lives saved because of this one single event. But yet, we're still dealing with a lot of issues in terms of rejection and organ shortage. The facts are fairly stunning. Every 30 seconds, a patient dies from diseases that could be treated with tissue replacement. So wouldn't it be great if we could actually just regenerate ourselves? Let's say we had a damaged organ. Wouldn't it be nice if the organ just would regenerate itself and get back to normal? Is that science fiction? Well, actually, there are many examples in biology where this occurs all the time. This is a salamander limb that you're seeing. This is real time-lapse photography showing that with an injured limb, it actually regrows within a period of about two weeks. So the fact is, if salamanders can do it, why can't we? So in fact, we do regenerate. We're regenerating all the time. I don't know if you realize this, but your skin is turning over about every two weeks. The lining of your intestines are tur turning over about every week. So you're constantly regenerating. So the question is, how can we actually take advantage of that capacity that you have to augment it and make it better? And that's where regenerative medicine comes in, which is really a field that brings different areas together. You can have materials alone, cells alone, or both together using other technologies to regenerate tissue. So let me tell you first how we can do it just using biomaterials alone. What are biomaterials? Basically, these are many different substances that you can find anywhere. They look like a piece of your cloth, like your blouse or your shirt, but they're designed to act in a particular manner inside your body. The materials we use are actually degradable. Once we implant them, they go away on their own in a period of about three months. So we're use only using them to insert them into the body and allowing the body to do whatever it needs to do, but then the material goes away on its own over time. So let me give you an example of this, how we're using these materials to actually regenerate tissue. This is a patient on the left, you see a, on the top left, you see an x-ray of a patient's organ that's injured, and you can clearly see that it's the top area that's injured. The bottom area is okay. So what we do is we take these materials, these biological materials that we developed back in the early 1990s in our, la in our laboratory, and we then use those materials to actually bridge the gap, if you will. We remove the top injured area, 
We then use that biological material on the top to replace that injured area, preserving the normal tissue below, and then you can see the patient's fully regenerated tissue six months later after surgery. Showing you that, in fact, your body can regenerate. By this time point, that material we put in is now totally gone. But what's happened is that the cells from the base are actually walking on that bridge, bridging the gap, if you will, allowing the tissue to regenerate and create that new organ that you see on the far right. Now, these materials work very well, but for only limited distances, small defects, small gaps. For other types of injuries, we can use cells alone, and these are actually amniotic fluid and placental stem cells. These are cells that we take from both the amniotic fluid and the placenta, and we can actually direct to become different tissues. So we get them from the afterbirth. After the baby's born, the placenta or the afterbirth is discarded. We take that tissue, we can get cells from that, we can get those cells to grow, we can drive those cells to become different cell types. Here you see how they are heart cells, not only if you can see how they're beating slowly, and these cells can be used for therapy. And there are now many trials out there using many different types of cells for heart disease. The other strategy that we use is using cells and biological materials or biomaterials in general. And the concept here is a patient presents to us, we take a very small piece of tissue from the injured organ, we expand those cells, the normal cells, outside the body, and we then coat those cells around the scaffold or that material again. And this is an example. These are actually muscle strips that we are engineering. We took that material and we coated that material with muscle cells. We took a biopsy of muscle from the patient and grew those out. And we then use these bioreactors or small exercise machines that exercise the tissue so it's ready before you implant it. We then use other strategies, for example, for tubular structures, slightly more complex than flat structures. So flat structures are the simplest because they're usually one cell type. Tubular structures are a little bit more complex. They have two different cell types. And you can see here on the far left, you can see the, bridge, the, the defect here. This is a bladder. This is a urethra. And this patient was in an injury in a car accident. And you can see this major area missing. And we're now going to have to replace the entire tubular segment. So we create a tubular segment out of, this, out of these biological materials. We coat it with the patient's own cells. We use two different cell types. We make this organ in the laboratory. Basically, four weeks later, it's ready to be placed back into the patient. We put it back in, and you can see that organ basically uh, six months after implantation. And we recently published a series of patients who are now seven years out with these experiences. This is a blood vessel that we are engineering. This is a bioreactor. Same strategy. We take a tubular scaffold. We place muscle cells on the outside. and blood vessel lining cells on the inside. Two different cell types, very much like the other organ I just showed you, but a different functionality. On the right, you see an artery that was replaced using these techniques. This is a carotid artery, which is the artery that goes from your neck to your brain, and we did this experimentally. This is a heart valve, same techniques. Now, we use these exercise machines so that we can condition these organs so they know how to function once we put them back into the body. So again, the concept is you take a small biopsy from the patient, you grow the cells out, coat the cells around these scaffolds, put it in these incubators and bioreactors, and you can see here the heart valve leaflets opening and closing, and then condition them, and then hopefully put them back into patients. Now, tubular structures, as I mentioned, are slightly more complex than flat structures, but hollow organs have a higher degree of complexity because they're hollow, non-tubular organs they're usually designed to act on demand, and the cells are usually more complex functionally. So we did this so as well for the bladder, which is one of these organs. We take a very small piece of tissue from the patient. We bring the patient six weeks in prior to their scheduled surgery. We take that small piece of tissue. We grow the cells outside the body. We expand the cells outside the body. We then create a scaffold or this biological material in the shape of the organ we then coat the inside with these lining cells that these organs have. We coat the outside with these muscle cells, very much like baking a layer cake, if you will. We're doing this one layer at a time. 
And once it's ready, we take it out of this oven-like device and put it back into the patient. This whole process takes about six to eight weeks. And this is actually a, a bladder that uh, was engineered on the left. On the right, you see how we create these bladders. And we also published this work uh, looking at a, over a five-year experience in patients back in, uh, uh, back in uh, uh, 2006. And so we now have uh, patients who have been treated in that manner as well. Now, solid organs are by far the most complex because you're dealing with a many, many different cell types much more complex cells functionally, but the challenge here is that these cells, being that they're solid organs, there are too many cells per centimeter, many, many more cells than flat, tubular, or hollow non-tubular organs. So by far, these are the most complex, and we have to figure out how to make sure that they stay alive with blood vessels and vascularity and nutrition. So we use many different strategies. One of the strategies that we use is we take discard organs like a liver, for example, that don't get used for uh, one reason or another. Many of the organs that get, uh, uh, actually get discarded. So we can take some of these organs, like a liver, we then use these washing machine type of devices with very mild detergents and we wash the cells away. It takes about two weeks to wash the cells away and two weeks later we're, some, we're left with something that looks like a liver, we can hold it like a liver, it feels like a liver, but it has no cells. But in fact, what we've been able to do is to preserve the blood vessel tree. And that's the blue that you see on that slide as it's being injected, that blue dye. And being that we preserve that blood vessel tree, we're then able to infiltrate the parenchyma or the meat of this donor organ that has no cells. With the patient's own cells, we're able to perfuse that blood vessel tree with blood vessel cells from the patient. And that is the concept and that we're working on right now. This is entirely experimental. We haven't done this in patients yet, but now we are able to create these miniature organs which are able to function uh, with a lot of these liver functionality, and we published that work just about a year ago. Now, we've also used other systems to create solid organs. This is an inkjet cartridge, but instead of using ink, we're going to use cells. And you're going to see a, a, your typical desktop inkjet printer here that we've modified. And now instead of printing ink, we're going to print cells one layer at a time. And the cells get printed with a gel. And you see this two-chamber heart that was printed. It took about 40 minutes to print. And then about four to six hours later, you see the whole structure beating. These are the, car the cardiac cells, the heart cells beating together. At first, they start beating erratically. And then within a few hours, they actually find their rhythm and start beating together. Again, this is experimental in terms of how to get these uh, structures uh, to go. Other more complex printing structures, we're using uh, x-rays. This is actually a, a patient. Through the x-ray, we can actually target the kids. So we uh, that again. Here's the, the body. And as you know, the kidneys are right there. And so what we do is we basically wait until uh, these x-rays are, let me just do that one more time. Sorry. There we go. Well, anyhow, you see where those kidneys are. And we then take that information from these kidneys and we then take that information that we have from this x-ray and that information gets transferred to computer and once it gets to the computer program we then are able to determine the three-dimensional shape of this organ and we now have more sophisticated printers that we've developed at the institute that are able to print these structures one layer at a time but down to the nano level where you can actually print down to the, stru the, uh, the structure the size of a hair and uh, Basically, we have been able to engineer miniature uh, kidney structures that are, have been implanted experimentally and actually are secreting uh, urine-like fluid. And you can see the typical units there, and we publish that work, and we are now using the printers to make these uh, larger. So to summarize, then, what I've tried to do for you today is really give you an overview of how we go about the field of regenerative medicine. The fact is that we can use many different cell types we can use many different types of cells. We can use materials alone or both together. Our preference, of course, is to use biological materials off the shelf, like I showed you with those first experiments where the cells just walk and walk on that bridge. The challenge is that you can only use those materials for small distances, about a centimeter uh, from each side or half a centimeter from each periphery. For larger structures, we need cells. 
and we may use cells alone to treat organs or cells with materials. And if we use cells, we prefer using the patient's own cells that will avoid rejection. And if we don't have that specific type, we then have to use uh, stem cell populations. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge some of the work that has been done by our team. This, we have an absolutely superb team at the Institute, over 300 people, all working together to bring these technologies from the bench to the bedside. We have now implanted, uh, I talked to you about the four levels of tissues, flat, tubular, hollow, non-tubular, and solid. We have now implanted the first three types of tissues into patients, and we are many years out with some of them but we have not yet implanted solid organs. And a lot of the strategies we're using today at the Institute are directed basically at making sure we can create solid organs safely and effectively for patients, as well as increase the number of the other types of tissues that we can deliver to patients long term. At this time, I, I would like really to share sick. a video I, with I you. I barely get out of bed. I was missing school. It was just pretty much miserable. I couldn't, you know, go out and play, you know, basketball at recess without feeling like I was going to pass out when I got back inside. It was, I felt so sick. I was facing basically a lifetime of dialysis and I don't even like to think about what my life would be like if I was on that. So after the surgery, um, life got a lot better for me. I was able to do more things. I was able to wrestle in high school. I became the captain of the team. and. That was great. I was able to be, you know, the normal kid with my friends and because they use my own cells to, you know, build this bladder, it's going to be with me. I got it for life, so I'm all set. I was really sick. I, I could barely get out of bed. I was... So that's uh, Lucas Masella. He's now uh, 10 years out from having received his engineered organ. That's a piece of, where he was interviewed about a year ago. Uh, you see, for us, the promise of regenerative medicine is not about the cells we use or the techniques we choose. It's all about making our patients better. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Atal, I, I had one question. Um, what is the uh, best case scenario that regenerative medicine has for our society and our world? Thank you. So basically, you know, one of the promises of regenerative medicine is the fact that we can actually not just manage disease. You know, so when you have a lot of these disease states, you're taking drugs, for example, to manage blood pressure or to manage diabetes. The promise of regenerative medicine, hopefully, is that not just to be able to manage disease, but also to cure it by using these replacement organs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.